turned out, of course, as most of you probably now know, uh, that it wasn't slowing down enough to come to a halt. It turns out that it's speeding up. And if there are planets there, then they're going to be similar to Venus, Earth, and Mars in our own solar system. But we're pretty convinced there are still larger things out there, uh, maybe much further away, maybe as big as Mars, maybe as big as the Earth. So we get to uh, use this for, as a lab for understanding how these objects form, how um, they evolve, how they grow, and how they affect their environment. And these are not nice neighbors. Howdy, everybody, and welcome to this panel. Uh, thank you very much for showing up. This is, uh, is going to be pretty exciting. We've got a pretty good crowd of astronomers coming on stage today, and we're going to be talking about some very, very interesting stuff, at least to me. I, I love astronomy, and I'll listen to people talk about it all night long, so get really comfy. we got quite a haul ahead of us here. Um, I, too, would like to thank uh, the 30-meter telescope and the National Science Foundation, Caltech, and, of course, Discover Magazine because they helped me pay my mortgage. Uh, it's a lot of fun writing a blog. I, people still call me a scientist. Um, I think of myself as a blogger, and I have to, you know, the, the, the definition of being a blogger is making sure you're wearing pants when you walk outside of the house, that, that sort of thing. Um, but what we have here tonight are four top-notch astronomers exploring, really, the very limits of what we know about the universe, starting here in the solar system, going all the way out. And so this is, I'm very excited to be moderating uh, this panel tonight. When you're, uh, oh, excuse me, I need to uh, have all of you say a little bit about yourselves. Dr. Perlmutter, if you could just briefly, and you guys are scientists, so briefly, okay, <laughs> summarize, summarize your work. <laughs> so uh, in, a, in a nutshell, um, I've, I've been working on uh, measuring the expansion history of the universe and I started out uh, looking to see how much it was slowing down because we expected gravity would be slowing it and we want to know if it would come someday come to a halt and collapse, worth knowing. And uh, it turned out, of course, as most of you probably now know, uh, that it wasn't slowing down enough to come to a halt. It turns out that it's speeding up in its expansion. And so now my work is mostly involved in trying to figure out why it's speeding up and what sort of dark energy perhaps could be causing uh, the universe to expand ever faster. So I'm Deborah Fisher from San Francisco State University, and my job is to find planets orbiting nearby stars. Uh, we're finding planets uh, at sort of all distances from stars, around all types of stars. And my favorite project right now is a search for planets around Alpha Centauri A and B. And if there are planets there, then they're going to be similar to Venus, Earth, and Mars in our own solar system. I'm Mike Brown. I'm from right here in Pasadena, and uh, I spend most of my time looking at the edge of the solar system for, for whatever else might be out there. Uh, the, the largest thing we've found so far is, is Eris that Phil told you about, the, the thing bigger than Pluto. But we're pretty convinced there are still larger things out there, uh, maybe much further away, maybe as big as Mars, maybe as big as the Earth. So uh, I'm spending most of my nights staring off into the sky looking for those sorts of things. I'm Andrea Gez. I'm from UCLA. I study the very heart of our galaxy, where, as Phil said, I discovered a supermassive black hole. And not only is it the best case for a supermassive black hole, but it's actually the nearest case uh, for one. So we get to uh, use this for, as a lab for understanding how these objects form, how um, they evolve, how they grow, and how they affect their environment. And these are not nice neighbors. When you started this work, all four of you, there were big questions. Were there planets? What are the Kuiper Belt objects, these comet-like objects at the edge of the solar system? What are they like? Is the universe slowing down? Are the big questions that you, first of all, excuse me, explain the big questions that you had when you started this research. And then as it evolved, have these questions changed? Are there different big questions now? So we'll just start with, with Saul and move down here. The original question that we started with sounded like a wonderful question. I couldn't imagine being so lucky as to be able to study a, just go out and do a measurement and find out whether the universe was going to last forever and find out whether it could be infinite or, or finite. I mean, they sounded like, you know, the exact kind of question I loved and I, I would love to be able to answer. And of course, you can not even be, well, it's rare that you could be even more lucky and have it turn out that that turns into even better questions. So, when we discovered that it wasn't slowing down and now it's speeding up, that potentially could tell us something very fundamental about how physics works. We're hoping that perhaps the explanation 
for why the universe is accelerating in its expansion might address questions like how do you tie gravity into the other forces in our understanding of, of physics. So uh, in that sense, the, ch the questions have really changed, but they're, if anything, you know, in that same category of very fundamental deep questions that, that I, I, for one, really just love. Well, as Phil said, one of the questions in the beginning was, are there other planets out there? Um, and as soon as the first few planets were found, they seemed so different from the planets in our own solar system that that question quickly morphed to, wait, how does our solar system compare to other solar systems? Now we know that the planets exist. Is there anything in common between our solar system and these other solar systems? Uh, other solar systems, stars have multiple planets, and what we see uh, in, in some cases is that these multiple planets uh, take up all of the gravitationally stable space. They fill the gravitationally stable niches around the star. So what I mean is, uh, to put that in context with, our, context with our own solar system, is, you know, at the time I was going out to fifth grade classes and doing scale models of the solar systems, and I'd be holding a beach ball that was the size of the sun, and the kids would be carrying these little peppercorns and running across the playground, you know, and, and my first thought was, you know, the solar system is so empty, why don't we have more planets? But in fact, it's not empty. Uh, people who run simulations and try to drop planets in find that all the other planets become gravitationally unstable. They take notice and the system falls apart. We started out with a solar system where there were many planetesimals forming and that evolved into a, a system where all the, the stable niches are filled. That's what we're finding in other solar systems and to me that's one of the most exciting um, d discoveries of, of, of this in this field. I, and I love this, too, because uh, it also means that there may have been planets that got ejected from the solar system. And so they're wandering the galaxy cold and dark and floating out there, and uh, maybe someday we'll find them. And there's probably a Star Trek episode in there waiting to happen. <laughs> Mike, th this actually, uh, I, I was going to answer slightly differently, but actually listening to Deborah and listening to Phil um, reminds me that one of the things that... that uh, that I did not initially set out to, to study, but has, has been very important in the study of the, the very outer part of the solar system, is that most of these objects that we find in the outer solar system are actually quite small. We, you hear about the big ones, you hear about Eris because it led to the very justified death of Pluto. Um, <laughs> and, <Hey>. um, <laughs> But really, it, for, for a lot of the very important science, it's not the big ones, it's, it's the small ones. The small ones are essentially little particles that sit in the outer solar system, and they're swept around by the giant planets. They're, they're swept gravitationally by where the planets go, um, what has happened to the planets. And, and the analogy um, that, that I really like is that, that these little objects in the outer solar system are essentially the blood splattered on the wall after some horrendous murder that's happened in the outer solar system. I love this analogy. Um, it's disturbing, but I love it. And the bodies have all been removed. So there might have been some of these planets that, that Deborah was talking about that, have been, that used to be here. They were gone, but the blood is still there. So I like to study the blood that's left around. I didn't know that this was where this, this field was going when I started. I thought that I was just very interested to know what are the largest things that are out there. Is there something bigger than Pluto? Um, what can we say about the outer, outter solar system? But as you go further and further studying these things, you realize the richness of everything you're finding and how it preserves this, this uh, forensic record of whatever happened in the, in the distant past. This is one of the things that I love about science is that you always end up with new questions. So it's job security. Um, so the, <laughs> what, what happened with my research is um, um, the stars that we used to prove that there was a black hole turned out to be very young. And it turns out that young stars have absolutely no right to be next to a black hole because a black hole should just shear them apart. Um, so we have no idea how these stars form. So that's the current, that's one of the major questions we're trying to address today is how do baby stars form next to this completely inhospitable um, object? What surprises do you think, wh what would happen to surprise you now? That, you know, short of, wow, everything I've done is completely wrong. Um, that, that's kind of the, the sucky surprise. Um, or uh, uh, something like that. What, and, and for example, Deborah, everybody expects that eventually we are going to find uh, an Earth-like planet. Not just of Earth's mass, but in the right orbit and is terrestrial. Earth-like, not like Jupiter. 
besides those sort of obvious ones, what would still surprise you in your work if you were to look at this and say, what is this? What kind of time scale do we get? Yeah. Because, uh, um, 200 well, years from now. Uh, well, I, I think uh, it would surprise me if the Earths aren't there. We've got the Kepler mission that's launching uh, soon, and it will find transiting planets and tell us something about the frequency of occurrence of small Earth-like planets. And, you know, on much longer time scales, I think it would surprise me if we don't find life at some point or some signature of life on planets where, you know, it's the right, the right conditions exist. There's liquid water. What's going to surprise yeah, you, Saul? Okay, my, my, I mean, there's so, I mean, almost anything we find out about dark energy could lead to a surprise, it, it, it looks like. But, so I was just trying to think of, you know, what would be a really crazy thing? I mean, suppose it turned out that we discover that the, when we're measuring this history of the expansion of the universe, we discover that it actually did something different in that direction and that direction. Um, that would be fascinating. You would, you would begin to start thinking that maybe we are getting a chance to see, you know, that the way that the universe behaves over here is, you know, very different from the way it behaves over there. And you could even imagine, you know, slightly different uh, instantiations of physics over here than over there. That would be, I think, one of the most amazing shocks uh, that you could imagine. I'm not betting on it. Right. <laughs> I'd, give it I'd give it low probability. I, I think I would say that the, the thing that would, be, that would surprise me the most would be to not be surprised. Um, and I'm very serious about that. Every time we find something in the outer parts of the solar system, it's different than we thought what was going to be out there. We really thought before we ever discovered anything, we thought we knew what we were going to find. And we went out and found stuff, and we had to keep on changing what we thought we were going to find. And it's just a continuous surprise. And if that surprise ever ends, it's, it's going to be uh, disappointing and a little bit boring. But I actually I think it won't end. I think we'll just keep being surprised. <laughs> Hard to follow on that one, um, but I'll try. Um, there are two black holes. There are two black holes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Yes, no, okay, well. Um, that surprised the hell out of me. Um, we had some great, some great questions that were sent into the Discover Magazine website for the announcement. Um, for Mike, and I, I like this one, that, um, we're finding more and more Kuiper Belt objects. How soon before we make a direct detection of Oort cloud objects, and would they have a similar composition? And of course, explain what Kuiper Belt. So, so the Kuiper Belt is, is what I spend most of my time studying. It's this this region of space outside of Neptune um, that extends out for a, a good bit of ways. It includes Pluto, it includes Eris that I discovered, and all the other things that I've been talking about are this this Kuiper Belt. The Oort cloud, which I'm sure many of you have heard of before, is is much much further away. It's the sort of hypothetical region of space where comets come from. It's kind of, it's about halfway between us and the nearest star. It's, it's incredibly far away compared to everything else we've ever seen. How are we going to ever detect something in the Oort cloud? We cannot figure out any way that this is going to happen. There's this region out there rich in bodies. I would be willing to bet anybody, because I'll never have to pay off, that there are things as the size of the Earth uh, larger out in this Oort cloud and we don't know how to see it. We, uh, we would like to know. If anybody has any ideas, let me know. Um, but uh, I don't know that we're ever going to, in my lifetime, have a way to find out. Um, how, how about waiting for them to come, to come in as, as comets and then exploring them as meteorites? We, we, we certainly, it's, it's in some sense saying that we don't see anything in the Oort cloud and it's hypothetical is a little bit cheap because we see comets coming in and we know where they came from but you would still like to see them out there. And more importantly, the really big ones that I think would be interesting don't come in very frequently, so we've never seen them. Um, so I, w I would love to figure out a way to get really get out there and see what's there. And I don't know how. Well, there are some it moons... pains me to admit it. There are some moons orbiting planets that are supposedly captured objects like this. Would there be any way of telling if they're different if they came from the Kuiper Belt or from the Oort Cloud? It's been the promise for a long time that, that, there, that these things out in the Oort cloud might be different in some way. The way you would find out would, of course, be to go study a lot of things in the Oort cloud, see how they're different, and uh, find them different in here. So instead, what we do is find things that are different, and we say, hmm, maybe it's because they're from the Oort cloud. Um, we, we just, it's one of those things where we really don't know enough about the, the situation to be able to make anything, say anything sensible about it. I, it's... I, it's one of the things that I would, I would love to be able to do it. I'm, I, maybe even I will figure out a way to do it, but uh, we, we stay frustrated. For Andrea, I actually got a great question about the, uh, 
the supermassive black hole in the center of the galaxy and uh, the Mayan prophecy of the end of the world in 2012. <laughs> but um, I, will, I will spare you that one. <laughs> um, that'll be on my blog eventually. Um, and I'll leave you an easier one, which is how do black holes affect the evolution of the universe? Uh -huh. <laughs> and yeah, keep it short. <laughs> maybe or, Saul or and I can answer this together. <laughs> maybe just the galaxy. Oh, the galaxy. Well, you know, it turns out these black holes, they're really big, but compared to the, uh, the galaxy, they're really small. So they don't have that much of an effect. So the good news is we have nothing to fear. We are safe out here. Um, so they really only affect the very, very closest stars to them. Well, there's... Uh, there have been observations that the black holes in the center are coupled to the galaxies themselves, that somehow the galaxy and the black hole know about each other because of the shape and the size and all that. So they must affect the formation of the galaxies themselves. Yes, so there is, there's been this interesting question over the years that, that has um, come into uh, uh, clearer view. In the beginning, we didn't know, was it the black hole that formed first or was it the galaxy that formed first? Was it it's the chicken or the egg question? But this observation more recently that the mass of the black hole is connected or seems to be related to the mass of the galaxy, which is, galaxy, which is so big means that they had to form together. They, they couldn't be separate events because the black hole, as I said, can't affect this really big object. So whatever gave rise to that galaxy had to give rise to the black hole. I get that question a lot. People say, are, are we affected by the black hole in the center? And I have to remind them, four million solar masses is a lot, but you're comparing it to 200 billion solar masses in, in the galaxy. And so it's really quite tiny, even though it's a scary thing to think about. So we're safe in 2012? <laughs> um, from that? Unless you're Mayan. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <Just check. laughs> um, oh, there's all, oh, there's a lot more. Uh, we should have a 2012 panel. That would be, <laughs> that would be fun. Everybody gets a sheet of tinfoil to... Uh, <laughs> um, for Deborah, this is a question I, I like because um, I got it a lot. And I know a lot of people have it. And that we've discovered over 300 extrasolar planets orbiting other stars. But they're detected indirectly. How do we know that these are planets? How, how, wh what sort of independent evidence do you have that, that what we're seeing is not something going on in the star or something weird, that there really are planets orbiting these guys? Well, that question is so 1990s. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, in the 1990s, 1995, 1997, we didn't know. And this was a huge source of controversy that people said, okay, yeah, you're, we, we believe you. We believe that your data are correct, that the star is either wobbling or it's pulsating. But we're not so sure about that interpretation that this wobble is connected with a planet. And we knew that if we observed, uh, uh, detected enough stars with planets, especially because the planets are very close to the stars, we knew that eventually we would see one solar system where the orientation was nearly edge-on so that the planet crossed the face of the star, the disk of the star. And when that happens, the starlight dims, okay? And the amount of dimming is proportional to the ratio of the radius of the star to the planet. You can see if the planet is as big as the star, it blinks out entirely. If it's much smaller, then a smaller fraction of light gets dimmed out. And from our technique, we're able to say exactly, we, we don't know if the orientation will be edge-on or tilted, but we can say if it is edge-on, at exactly, you know, 9.45 tonight, you'll see the starlight dimming. And so that's what we did in 1999 with the star HD 209458. And within 30 minutes of the predicted time, uh, Greg Henry at Tennessee State University was looking at five stars with his telescope, and one of them the star that we predicted would dim, uh, in fact, did dim a little bit. And so we saw the shadow. It's been called the shadow of the planet crossing the face of the star. And as a result, we're able to measure the radius of that planet and figure out what it was made out of. Since then, people have actually looked with the Hubble Space Telescope and seen evidence of the atmospheres of the star, detected the atmospheres of the stars themselves. Planets. planets. I'm sorry, the, the yeah. atmospheres of the planets themselves as they're, you know, the carbon, di carbon monoxide is boiling off or hydrogen is boiling off from the planet atmosphere. So I think we, we do have uh, fairly direct evidence. All science has to have many, you know, many sort of approaches that fit together 
so that you know your your hypothesis becomes a theory that's well grounded and supported. And I think we're at that point now where we've got many lines of evidence that that show that this is the these are indeed planets. A, a final specific question for Saul. And that is that, um, and this is another good one, the discovery that 96% of everything, I love that, everything, is dark matter and dark energy would, would seem to indicate that we need a new theoretical model of the universe. What are the leading candidates? I like questions like that. What is the universe? You know, give three examples. <laughs> I mean, what's, what's amazing right now is that the theories, I mean, it used to be that you know, the theories of, of how you explore dark matter, we were coming out you know, relatively slowly uh, for a little while. Once the dark energy came into the picture, now it's 10 years ago, um, it just exploded. We've been watching, I, I think most of you know that now that you can see all the papers show up on the web. Uh, there's these you know, standard archives that the, uh, all the physicists and astronomers post all their papers to. And I went back and looked, and I think it's been averaging Every three days for the past 10 years, there's been a new paper um, proposing ideas for what dark energy might be. Um, and <laughs> as you might imagine, they probably can't all be right. Um, <laughs> but, and then what's interesting, though, is I, I think that I'm not sure if almost any of the authors of those papers would say, I think I've got the answer. I think almost every single one of them would say, no, no, I'm just expanding the range of, of ideas. And, uh, and we have to consider you know, more, more options. And uh, they really throw the ball back into you know, our court, the, the observers and the experimentalists, to give them some more clues. So I guess I'm feeling on pretty firm ground now, saying that the theory of everything is you know, unknown. That we're, 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 clu we're pretty clueless still on, <laughs> on what's going to turn out to be the answer for this, you know, this particular mystery of you know, what's going on with particularly dark energy. And I think dark matter is still fairly much in that same camp at the, the moment. You, know, you always hope that someday somebody's going to have this aha moment and they're going to suddenly say, ah, wait, well, I can explain it all, you know, dark energy and dark matter and, of course, you know, gravity. And, uh, then, and then, of course, you know, everybody will, will be very glad and we'll, and we'll be done. Mm. End of science. Yeah, but, <laughs> but, but, but maybe not too soon. I think now it's going to be time for Q&A from the audience. So if you have questions, and, and I mean, really, what, what kind of questions could you possibly have for this group of people, right? Um, you can line up. There's a microphone here and here. Please, uh, when you come up, state your question clearly uh, and concisely, because I'll come down and give you trouble if you soapbox uh, up here. Uh, and go ahead and direct your questions to, uh, to the panelists. Okay, I'll try. Uh, we have uh, giant stars, dwarf stars, planet, uh, brown dwarfs, planets, and so on. Is there any range uh, in the scale, in the size scale, in which you see a lack? Maybe this is for the, uh, the planet folks in particular, from brown dwarfs to planets. Is there anything where nature kind of has a dip and we don't see a very large population? <laughs> Should I take everyone's looking at me? Yeah. <laughs> so, so there is a brown dwarf desert. Uh, and one of the problems has been that the brown dwarfs have been very hard to find. Uh, at least as companions to stars, there seems to be somewhat of a dearth of these objects. So um, at that end, I guess at the high mass end, you know, we know that there's a limit to how big stars can be as well, set by what's called the Eddington luminosity limit, um, more massive than about 100 times the mass of the sun, and the star has too, so much energy uh, coming out that it can't uh, hold together. I would say in, in the solar system, there's actually a, a very interesting thing too, which is, and, and convenient, which is that the, the planets are all quite big. The difference between the biggest planet, uh, I'm sorry, the smallest planet, which is, which is Mercury, and the next biggest thing that's not a planet, which is the one that I found, Eris, is, is pretty extreme. It, it makes it easy to draw the line there. So there is this, this missing set of objects in between. It's actually not a mystery why they're missing, or at least it's not a mystery that they're missing. If there were things in between, they would start to uh, gravitationally move each other around until somebody got kicked out. And so there has to be large dominant objects and, and some very small ones in there too. So it's actually, it's, it's in some ways a very profound way to look at the, uh, the solar system. 
In fact, in the black hole game, there's also a gap. Um, so there are little black holes, just a mere three times the mass of the sun, and then there are these supermassive black holes, which are a million to a billion times the mass of the sun, but there's this big gap in between. And, and we call these things intermediate mass black hole, but no one's ever seen one. <laughs> why, why is there a gap? Um, well, it may be a technology that. Uh, uh, case that they're hard to find. Um, so the little ones are close to us, and the big ones are far away, but really big, and the intermediate ones are some, they're, they're kind of like the middle child. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they were only recently discovered. Well, there's still a lot of controversy right. over, over whether or not they exist, but you know, we're after them. We see something that looks like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll switch, uh, we'll go back and forth. Okay, since we are talking about the universe, what about the universes plural? Uh, I would be very curious to know what you guys think about the, those theories like parallel universes or, uh, you know, the continuous creation of universes like inflation theories and that kind of stuff, whether you think it's uh, metaphysics or it's something real. Okay. Um, I'll take a, a cut of it. Uh, you go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, in some sense, uh, it's almost a philosophical question, right? If, if there were completely un disconnected universes um, that we had absolutely no interaction with and never did, never will, you can almost ask, well, what, what do we mean by talking about another universe? Uh, because, you know, it's, it's almost an imaginary uh, concept it, it, in, in that sense. But there's another sense where people use um, what seem to be parallel universes where there are ways where you can explain behavior of our universe by assuming that it comes from a population of universes and that uh, you can make predictions as to what the behaviors would be of our universe coming out of, out of these population distribution arguments. So far, I would say that those have been not yet well received by the, uh, you know, the larger scientific community, and I, I don't think that they're yet compelling arguments. But if someday somebody manages to make a very compelling argument where they can predict precisely certain things that we should then go look for in our universe that we don't already know, and we find that they get the answer right, I think that might be a compelling evidence that, that we actually do live in one universe that's coming from a distribution of many universes. And I think that would be fascinating if that, if that ever were the case. Is there a parallel universe where Pluto's a planet? <laughs> oh. I was hoping there's a parallel universe where I was Brad Pitt, so that kind of that ruins that one, too. Okay, go ahead. Do you think there could be life on other planets? Ooh. Well, um, I... So now we're leaving the realm of what's science and what we know, and we're trying to sort of put a trajectory ahead. We're playing the role of perhaps theorists, imagining what will be. And uh, to me, it's hard to imagine that there isn't life somewhere else. We look up at other galaxies, even in our own galaxy, and we see that these galaxies are glowing with these molecules called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. They become the building blocks of proteins. Um, and so, you know, I, I, the raw material is out there. A biologists look here on Earth at life in extreme environments and say wherever there's water, you know, life, it's a good solvent for life. And so I, I would bet yes. I'll bet you $100 yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if it's the kind of life, though, that's going to sort of, you know, be scum in a pond or if it's the kind of life that walks up to a microphone and asks questions. <laughs> I, I would even bet that hundred dollars that in your lifetime somebody will actually get to Mars and discover some sort of small microbes that are actually still there. I, I would not be surprised and I'd even be willing to, to bet that hundred dollars. Better write that down. <laughs> <laughs> His lifetime, I'll be going. <laughs> That's a great question. Go ahead. Um, having been a subscriber to Discover Magazine for over a decade, I just wanted to put that in. As you all should. <laughs> and um, having read multiple uh, reasons for the, the Big Bang Theory, um, I'd like to present this to Dr. Perlmutter. Um, the possibility that uh, dark energy or dark matter is possibly, uh, well, the, that the Big Bang started from a pinprick so could there be something leaking from another side into the universe, therefore causing the expansion of the universe? There's been this um, 
long-standing tradition of using the analogy you know, of, a, of a balloon uh, expanding for the universe, and then you, you work your way backwards in, in time, you get to the point where you're imagining everything coming from, from a point. And I've been sort of on this campaign to try and get people to stop talking about balloons. Um, I don't know what's going to work. But, <laughs> yeah, so, and, and, and the reason is because I think that the, our best current picture of the universe, if you, you know, had to use the current data, you would say that we live in an infinite universe, and as far as we can tell, it's a what you know, technically you call a flat infinite universe, not flat the way, you know, not pancake, we wouldn't be here, but, um, but infinite um, that you can go as far as you want in any direction and you get somewhere new. It's not, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's not the, this sort of closed, spooky thing that people have been trying to explain to us for many years. It's the kind of familiar space that we all know and love, which is you travel and you get someplace. You know? So that, that being the case, you start working your way backwards in time in, a, in, a, in our current cosmological pictures. In the simplest cosmology, you just suck space out between every, you know, me and you and, and all the other, you know, each one of you, a little bit of space is disappearing between you. You're getting closer and closer to each other, becoming better friends um, as time goes on. And as you go back in time, eventually everybody's right on top of each other. But uh, the universe is still, as, as far back as we can still do the calculations, the universe still looks infinite. You can still go as far as you want in any direction. It's just very dense. And you got so dense that you actually can't do any calculations anymore um, that, are, that are meaningful, that the, uh, our physics happens not to work in that very hot, dense regime. And that's as far as we know, and we call it the Big Bang. Now, it's not as fun a Big Bang as, you know, this picture of a you know, little dot exploding, um, but I think it's probably our best current picture um, of, of what we're talking about. And so it doesn't really have that sort of spooky st sense of a pinprick, you know, of, of, of you know, where we start. It may turn out someday that we'll discover new evidence that makes us have to all go back to our old textbooks again and relearn all that stuff about you know, space curving around on itself that was you know, uh, fashionable in, in all of our uh, you know, childhood readings. But, um, but I, at the moment, I would say you could actually do very well with a perfectly flat, infinite universe that goes, stays infinite as far back as you want, and then we don't know what happened before that, and that's what we're calling the Big Bang. And of course, we're you know, really working hard to invent ways of figuring out what happened just before that and just before that. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> Taking that all in. I guess it's the worst model we have for the Big Bang, except for all the other models. Exactly. So, yeah, it's too bad. Yeah, let me know yeah. if the balloons go away. <laughs> Hi there. Uh, my question has to do with uh, the, if there is a force that is causing the universe to expand, okay, which there obviously must be, and we don't know what it is, and then I go uh, compare that to subatomic particles where I don't have a very good explanation for why it is that the electrons don't collapse into the nucleus, okay? Uh, do you believe that at some point in time we'll find that there's a connection between those two and when we explain one, we can explain the other? Well, actually, one of the favorite historical explanations that people now go back to and say, ah, you know, uh, we could have predicted um, that the universe was expanding faster and faster, um, comes from back when Einstein put in a fudge factor into his equations uh, for general relativity. Uh, you know, Einstein makes fudge, sound, fudge factors sound good. Um, he calls them, you know, uh, the Greek variable lambda and names it the cosmological constant. But it was just put there temporarily to sort of make the universe kind of balance because he didn't believe that it was expanding or contracting. You know, 12 years later, he could have, you know, he, Hubble found out that it really was expanding. And, uh, and of course, you know, we now know that Einstein was wrong. He, he could have predicted it. He could have been famous. Um, <laughs> 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 but so, but still, that's still, uh, later, um, people start realizing that the cosmological constant could um, be easily identified with the the quantum mechanical effect that the vacuum is, is a humming, buzzing place of virtual particles appearing and disappearing you know, all, all the time. Right. And uh, actually, that is in some ways related to the uh, explanations for why the electron doesn't fall into the, uh, the proton. It's you know, the ground state of, of all fields and particles. Um, it has a, a, a minimum. And so the vacuum is this humming, busy you know, uh, place. Traditionally, everybody's assumed that the effect of that hum was not going to have a major effect on the expansion of the universe because every calculation you do for what the hum should, that, you know, the hum of the vacuum should cause in the expansion of the universe comes out, uh, you know, suggesting that it should be expanding faster and faster, but 10 to the 120 times more than we actually see. So the assumption has always been that there is just 
uh, different families of particles, and that they would uh, that the hum of one set would cancel the hum of the other. That's sort of an odd way of thinking about it, but uh, and that way the universe would stay in balance and it wouldn't be uh, accelerated. But now, of course, we see an acceleration, and so one possible explanation is that the hums of one set don't quite cancel the hum of another. They're, they cancel about 10 to the 120 worth, and then they leave a little part left over. And uh, that could end up being the explanation, in which case your answer, your question would be exactly on target, that it'll turn out that it's that quantum mechanical hum that's the explanation for why the universe is accelerating in its expansion. But at this stage, that still seems pretty bizarre because you, know, you still have to explain why is it that you get this perfect balance to a part in 10 to the 120, but not perfect. And, uh, and so that's you know, where we stand now. Okay. And to give you an idea of how big of a number that is, 10 to the 120, that's 100 million trillion Google. So right. we're not talking about chump change here. It's kind of remarkable. Wow. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, my question is about the nature of time. Uh, and I have to make sure I'm, I'm uh, basing it on a correct premise. And so I'm time. sorry, we're out of time. So. Oh, dear. <laughs> Obvious, I know. I shall take my leave. Uh, so uh, uh, Einstein tells us that time slows down in the presence of mass, correct? I'm not mistaken on that. Time slows down in your massive objects. Yeah, okay. So uh, if, if, that's, if that's the case and time slows down near massive objects, then does that mean that the universe is younger in the presence of mass than it is in the great voids between the galaxies? And what does that mean for what time was doing near the Big Bang when all the mass was there at once? So th this is the funny thing. It's a question of how well we agree on the time. Fair enough. <laughs> so there's actually no intrinsic contradiction. It's just two, pl two people in different places can't agree about how time is passing. So that's how you get out of it. Okay, so it's a frame of <laughs> reference thing then. Wow. <laughs> you can go into more detail no, if you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so that would, be, that would mean that near the, uh, near the time of the Big Bang, everybody would just be going, their older watches would be slow, so nobody would be late. Right? So <laughs> You're all in the same place, so you don't disagree. Okay, cool. <laughs> yes? Um, this probably also falls into the category of theories, but do you, what do you think about the validity of wormholes? Ah, the wormholes. What comes out on the other side? Yeah. So it, that's an interesting idea. So the idea here is you've got black holes that um, take things in, and that maybe something comes out on the other side. And so that gets us into the, um, the sort of realm of science fiction because we can't test it. So we, we can let it be without worrying about whether or not it really is. So it's, it's, a, a math, it's mathematically possible, but we, we'll, we'll never know whether or not it's true. <laughs> could, you, could, you ma could you imagine some It's an answer. It's probably not the one you want, but it's an answer. <laughs> uh, yes, I've heard of uh, dark matter and dark energy, and recently I heard of a uh, dark flow where galaxies are flowing in a general direction in the universe. So what would be the attractor in the universe to make that happen, or would be something beyond the universe to make the galaxies flow in that general direction? I think it was in a, uh, a British paper in uh, September that came up with that. I wrote about this on my blog and had my head handed to me by a half dozen cosmologists, so I'd love to hear the answer to this, actually. I, I didn't read it because I, I don't speak British, so I didn't see it. Uh. <laughs> I'm not thinking that one. Did I, <laughs> I, 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 I should you know, cheerfully admit first that I, I, I'm, I'm not, I d have not read the, uh, the particular paper, but I, I would... beat everybody, yes! <laughs> you win one internet, I would make a bet that... Uh, that I mean, I, I'm, I'm fairly sure that you know, what, what they'd be describing would be that you know, people are very interested in studying large uh, you know, congregations of galaxies and then how they, they affect each other and how they behave. And so one of the things that people would look for is you know, common motions uh, of them. I think it, these are all definitely within the realm of our own uh, universe that, that, we're, that we know and love. And, uh, and I think people are not looking for explanations. And they don't need to look for explanations that will go outside. Um, at this stage yet. On the other hand, uh, you know, you, if you do see some, some very large motions of galaxies, it would be rather surprising. And, that, and I think you would have to come up with new theories to, to handle it. Now, I don't know what your blog uh, uh, Not that. controversy was. <laughs> see, when you say it, it sounds great. It sounds smart. If, you know, if I'd written that, I would get a bunch of comments comparing me to Hitler. So. <laughs> 
That's that's the difference between being a research scientist and a guy who blogs in his basement at, at home. So there you go. Yes, go ahead. Hi, could you speculate on the origin of the asteroid asteroid belt? Ooh. I, I could do that. Um, I can speculate on most anything. So, uh, but I might so be right Superman. about this one. Yeah, okay. so, so, so the asteroid belt is, is between Mars and Jupiter, and the largest object in the asteroid belt is, uh, is significantly smaller than, than any of the planets, any of the, the moons. It's, they're very small objects. So there are thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of objects in there. What we think happened in the asteroid belt is it's a region of space where things were trying to coalesce to become a planet. They should have become a planet. If you took all those things and swept them out together, we would almost even be willing to call them a planet on a bad day. Um, but they didn't get swept up together. Why didn't they get swept up together? Well, all the other planets eventually got swept up together, but in the asteroid belt, it's too close to Jupiter. And Jupiter is the bad guy of the solar system. Anytime you get too close to Jupiter, uh, you guys might remember a decade more than a decade ago, when that, that comet hit Jupiter, came close to Jupiter first, got split into 21 different pieces before plummeting in. Imagine that same thing happening to all these things in the asteroid belt. They're trying to come together. Jupiter gets a little too close. They get, they get uh, um, pulled apart again. And so it just never had the opportunity all again because of Jupiter. So it's, it's material that should have been a planet. And if Jupiter had never existed, it would have been a planet, but it uh, never quite made it. Gravitationally unstable areas? It's not unstable. Um, if it were unstable, all those things wouldn't be there. It's one of the very few stable regions. But as Deborah was saying, she was saying that there was no region that was, uh, uh, un no region that was stable that was not filled. It's filled. Right. There are many things there. But it's, it's, it's stable, but it's, uh, it's, it, gets, it just gets um, too much uh, mucking around by Jupiter. So every time it tries to sort of gently collide together, Jupiter goes and spreads it apart again. Yeah, I, I have a very quick one here for Andrea uh, concerning our, our famous black hole in the center of the galaxy. I understand recently there's data presented that shows we're off by about 50% on the mass of the black hole, that they, they linked up 10 radio telescopes giving an effective aperture size of about 6,000 miles, and they measured the mass of some stars at different radiuses in our galaxy, and then from that, just basic Newtonian mechanics, they calculated the mass of the black hole. And first of all, I'm wondering, well, they're using baryonic mass to predict the mass of the black hole, and, it, and therefore one would assume, well, maybe the black hole is all baryonic mass as opposed to in no dark matter or dark energy. So that one question is, well, what, what kind of mass makes up the black hole? And then I had another question about some black holes are rotating at very high velocities, and some aren't. And are the ones that are rotating, is there any change in those dynamics? Are they slowing down, speeding up? What are the forces causing the rotation? And uh, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the first thing is um, the recent result yeah. um, is not on the mass of the black hole, because uh, that would mean my result was wrong. So it's actually somebody <laughs> else's result that was wrong. It was the mass of the galaxy. So in fact, according to the observations, which was measured, which, which using radio telescopes measured these special stars and their, their motions and how fast they were going. They're going faster than we measured, we'd measured them before. The faster they go, the more mass there should be. So the inference about how massive our galaxy is um, went up. So our, our basically, yeah, I guess our galaxy went in a binge or something. <laughs> um, so that's, that's the answer to your first question. Yes, we gained weight. Well, you agree um, with it. But it was the galaxy. Okay. Um, see if I can get all the questions. Then the second question was about what's inside the black hole. What's our black hole composed of? of? Yeah, what is the nature of the, ma of the mass of the and black the hole? And the answer is we don't know. Could be baryonic, could be no, dark it's energy. Well, I mean, we have this interesting problem with black holes. So what is a black hole? A black hole is a region of space where, well, you have mass that's confined to zero volume as we understand it, which means that the density is infinitely large, which means that we have no way of describing really what a black hole is. So I get out of this question really easily, which is to say, 
don't know, can't describe it, okay. except to say that the fact that there's black, these things of black holes where the density goes to infinity means that we don't have our descriptions of physics quite right. So I think the question really is um, about our description of the physical world as opposed to the um, matter content of the black hole. Now you asked another question. Um, about the rotational. About the spin of the black hole. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so black holes can, ha can be described by three quantities. They're, they're kind of you know, straightforward objects. You don't get to describe them with anything else. Mass, spin, and electric charge. So far, the only thing we've been able to measure for them uh, with confidence is the mass. <laughs> And the next, the next best uh, thing we can go after is the spin. So the spin's really hard to measure, but I'm not, I'm, I'm not actually forgetting the, co the full content, wh which is, uh, are things speeding up, slowing down? Was that well, what, that what are the forces involved in setting up okay. the dynamics of the rotational energy or lack right. thereof? Why do black holes spin is basically what you're asking? Don't spin. Yeah. Okay, so why do black holes spin? Um, so there, um, to answer that, we have to understand, or we have to ask ourselves, how do they form? And if we could answer that, <laughs> we'd also be able to answer your question. And so there are two models. Um, one, uh, or how do black holes grow, is actually uh, maybe the more relevant question. Um, one is by um, black hole mergers, which are big events, uh, versus um, little accretion events. So if we think that they're big, actually this really relates to planet it's formation. The it's the same <laughs> stuff. If you have big crashes, you get lots of spin. If you have little drips and drabs, you don't get the object spinning very much. So there's this thought that if we could measure the spin of a lot of black holes, we could figure out how they formed. Okay. I want to know how Nemesis might affect the Kuiper belt and the Oort cloud. The, the nemesis uh, hypothesis, for those who you know, haven't been paying close attention to this, uh, this burning issue, was the idea that um, there could be another sun uh, orbiting with our sun. And that wouldn't be so shocking. Most stars in the sky have companions orbiting uh, you know, around them or around each other, companion stars orbiting around each other. Um, this one would have to be pretty far away, because the orbit would be on the order of every 26 million years, and the idea being that it would be a slightly a, a, a elliptical orbit, so that it comes a little bit closer every 26 million years, and when it comes a little closer, it would disrupt the Oort cloud of comets enough so that it would send the, randomize them a little bit and send those that were uh, cleaned out by Jupiter, as, as you had mentioned, um, back into the inner solar system, where they would hit the Earth and cause mass extinctions, and we still have another 13 million years, so don't get too worried. Um, but this was proposed as an explanation for why it was that you seem to see mass extinctions on the Earth roughly every, well, it, it was actually a remarkably good clock of every 26 million years, um, where you know, one of them was the one that, that killed the dinosaurs, and then there have been other ones uh, you know, uh, since and before. So... The thought was that if, uh, first of all, why have we not seen this star if it's, you know, orbiting around our, our sun? You think we would have noticed it? And the argument was that, well, these are, this is so far away that its orbit, and its orbit is so slow that for all of our measurements, it's looked like it was really still uh, in, in the sky. You would not have noticed the, noticed the orbit at all. And, uh, and in fact, it would have masked itself um, because the most common kind of star in the sky is a very faint red dwarf. And uh, it, you, we always thought that it was bright because it was one of the red giant stars, which are actually much brighter than the red dwarfs, hence the name. Um, but in fact, it was a, it's a very close, faint star, a red dwarf. And I can, I can tell you that we did not find it in the northern hemisphere search that we were doing um, at that time. As I understand it, there's, they have not yet completed the full survey to prove that this isn't, uh, isn't the case. But that was the story of, uh, of, of Nemesis, of, of how it, and, and why it was thought to be of interest in, uh, in randomizing the Oort cloud, and then, of course, why we have a big difference for us here on Earth. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to so, add so, to well, so the, the, the quick yeah. modern answer to the question of how it would affect the Kuiper belt and, and the, uh, the Oort cloud answered is that, um, where I said earlier that the, the Kuiper belt is in some ways these, this blood splattered on the wall. Well, Nemesis would have been one of these, these uh, it would have actually been the killer, not just the body. Um, if Nemesis exists, it, it would have left very distinctive signatures in this blood spatter. The problem is, where it would have left it is in the very, very distant part of the solar system that we have not explored particularly well 
Yeah, not even just the Kuiper Belt, not quite as far out as the Oort Cloud, but there's this middle region where we currently know of one object, and we're looking for a lot more. But if we can find even, even a dozen objects in this, little, in this middle region, um, that'll tell us, I think, pretty definitively uh, whether something like Nemesis exists or not. So, so stay tuned. I think it's in the next five, ten years we'll really be able to answer that question with, with very little doubt. And I've been waiting for this moment now for a few minutes. For those of you who can't see, this gentleman is wearing a T-shirt that says, Pluto, never forget. Never forget. Um, <laughs> so you have a question for Andrea, I I'm question. guessing. Uh, yeah. I recently read an article that says that there's some evidence that the Voyager spacecraft is accelerating. Um, is there oh. a consensus on why that's happening? Can, can we have the person uh, who started uh, his here answer this question? <laughs> this, this, is, this is Ed Stone's uh, uh, question. But somebody else want to answer it if he won't stand up? <laughs> I think we should ask him to answer. I think you should. I, I, you, I don't know the answer. <laughs> you should answer that. <laughs> Do we have a, Do you have a lovely... Come on up to the... It's a great question, yeah. but he's the one who answered it. Well, first of all, it's actually a pioneer effect. Pioneer. Okay. Right. And it's, uh, there is a very subtle, about one billionth of the acceleration of gravity <laughs> is acceleration. So it's a very tiny effect. They are reanalyzing the data to see if, in fact, they can understand if there's some residual uh, emission from this little thrust from the spacecraft that's causing this effect. Ah. But uh, still, still a mystery. But there's no more data because the pioneers have quit transmitting yeah. about 10 years ago. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> See, I, I didn't know that. So, was good. so I'm really excited that 2009 is International Year of Astronomy. And it's also International Year of Science. And um, Flat Stanley here is part of International Year of Science. <laughs> and he came to hear you guys. And he's really excited about astronomy, too. I was wondering uh, if you could share your feelings about public engagement in science and astronomy. And it, it's such a wonderful thing to be able to come to something like this. And it's probably good for you guys, too, to come here and be able to talk to real people instead of just your colleagues and other scientists. Um, so, and, and I'd also like to say that uh, I think that um, it, whatever money NSF put into this event is well worth the money, and it, they should be spending more money on events like this, too. Thank you so I, I'd like to hear from all of you, actually, on, on what your feelings are, what your hopes are for International Year of Astronomy, how you plan to engage the public this year, and um, what you hope 2010 is going to be for astronomers after this year. Wow. I, well, wow. Yeah. Um, awesome. I guess I would love to answer this question because I think one of the privileges of being an astronomer is we're working in a science that's easily accessible to the public. So I think it's actually part of our responsibility to talk about science um, to the general public as we're doing here today and as hopefully will happen many, many, many more times in um, 2009. Um, so I think that it's not for us to talk about ast ast astronomy really for astronomy's sake, but really as a science that's easily accessible. And I would say I, I, I find astronomy just so so fascinating and, and so much fun and so accessible that I'm, I'm always like grabbing people off the street and saying, hey, did you guys see you know, Venus and the moon here tonight as you walked in? And, uh, and so I, I love coming to events like this. The, the best example I can give of, of how much... How, how, how excited I am to be here tonight is that I actually am here tonight instead of home with my, my three-and-a-half-year-old daughter, who I, I rarely uh, leave because I'd almost rather be with her than anything. But before I came in tonight, I made sure to run and, and show her uh, the moon and Venus, too, because that's just... So I, I want, in this International Year of Astronomy, um, if there's anything I can convince people to do, I want people to actually not just sit here and listen to astronomers and think about astronomy, but I want them to look at the sky. So what I want everyone to do when you walk out tonight... Um, Venus and the moon will have set, so it's too late. But as you walk out these doors right here, you can look right up here. You'll see Orion. You'll see, you'll see Sirius. Just look up at the sky for a minute and, and just think about what's out there. That's what I want. So the International Year of Astronomy, of course, was designated by the United Nations, which is pretty cool. And it's the 400th uh, celebration anniversary of Galileo and the telescope that, that he built. And uh, for me, we were talking a little earlier this evening 
about the a study that came out recently from the University of Michigan that only 25% of U.S. adults are scientifically literate. And, uh, and we were commenting that, you know, that's not the case for kids. I mean, when their kids are in school and great, you know, grade school, middle school, high school, they're learning science. And somehow they get out of uh, high school and, and they go on and they get, you know, busy with their careers and they forget about it. Uh, and so it's hard for them to read uh, an article and understand what's going on, make sense of it, and, you know, weigh the balance of pros and cons and so forth. So I'm pretty sure that all of us are going to be giving a lot of public talks, and I hope that it's a chance to uh, spark enthusiasm in the American public for science. As, as you can tell, uh, we're all very shy, retiring people who don't like be, being here in public. Um, but, but I, you know, I think we, uh, we obviously do get a real kick out of uh, a chance just to talk. But for, for me, I, mean, I think there's also this, this extra element that I, I always feel that science is, you know, it's not just this collection of facts and, and you know, things you can look out that, that, you know, you can, you can find out. But for me, it's, it's just a, an approach to asking questions about the world, an approach to, you know, how you, how you ask about almost anything you could do in life that everybody should be uh, enjoying and sharing. And I think it would make for perhaps slightly more uh, effective you know, voting patterns, I, I'd like to believe. But, um, <laughs> but in, it just in general, I, I sort of feel that we all need a you know, whole range of, of styles to approach the world with. And it's one of the reasons that you know, I think it's very important to have had a very strong you know, uh, English background and you know, literature background. And, and science is one of those uh, because it gives you another set of glasses to wear when you look at the world. And, one that I think is particularly effective when it comes to asking questions that where well, you have to make a decision. And I, I really do feel that there's something crucial about the, you know, the, the extent that we can teach how we approach the world as scientists um, that it's just a pleasure for everybody to experience and maybe makes everybody feel they could use it whatever they're doing in life, whether they're doing science or not. We are out of time, and I can't think of a better question to have ended on than, than the International Year of Astronomy. I'd like to once again thank our sponsors, the National Science Foundation, Discover Magazine, I'll get it right this time, uh, the 30-meter telescope, and Caltech for hosting us here tonight. Thank you very much, and thank our panelists once more.